thank you. I'll try to keep my comments brief so we have a lot more discussion time. Uh, but I was rather intrigued by how the four seemingly disparate presentations actually ended up kind of speaking to each other, uh, almost as if they were contagious kind of themes, uh, which really in some ways is at the core of what runs through it. Because if Cosman began with this idea of the fear of contamination and of, uh, of contagion, he really spoke in some ways to kind of two registers of fear. Uh, on the one hand, you know, the idea of the diseased body and, 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 and the other uh, contamination. So referring in a way to, to a political disorder, but also a biopolitical disorder which is connected to each other. And while each has its own kind of political vocabulary, there's also a very different kind of a visual register that they, 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 they occupy. In the post 9-11 world, of course, we're familiar with the fact that uh, the entire political ecology of fear is grounded on, on border protection and on, uh, on the fear in a way of the crossing of, of borders. Uh, so what seems to be really interesting is that what happens when you have a scenario where it's not really about borders in terms of the inside and the outside in terms of two different kinds of nations, but the post you know, transition moment of Hong Kong, where you're really talking about a very blurred scenario where the inside and the outside are indistinguishable and precisely the conditions uh, in which one can think about the entire idea of the fear of contamination by viruses. Uh, because it's really about a force that enters your body, uh, contaminating it from, 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 from within. And in, in a way, what was interesting for me is that this uh, a running theme across the four papers is also the new interface of fear that has emerged, which is really the question of uh, social media and, and, and virality. Why is it that social media has taken on the language of the virus and of its kind of, you know, uh, of its con contagion? Uh, but it's not merely a, a platform for fear, but also the articulation for the possibilities of a whole range of creative forms and of a whole range of life. So for me, the two terms that would bring together the four presentations is really the relationship between virality on the one hand and vitality on the other. There is a, a good reason for a revival of interest in zombie films in the recent past, zombie films, zombie comics, etc. you know, like The Walking Dead, uh, because if there is a constant comparison that one could make between the zombie and, you know, Agamben's character of the, of the homo sacco, because this is a life that both has to be protected as well as protected from. Uh, so what was interesting for me is that this idea of the protection that often emerges is really that of the, the quarantine effect or the freezing. And in Chinyi's presentation, that was really uh, an intriguing way in which the idea of the frozen effect of citizenship really comes through, right? Where citizenship is constituted not under the sign of rights, but under the sign of a crisis, in this case articulated in terms of a developmentalism of a catching up. Very similar to the Indian experience where Nehruvian modernity also postponed uh, luxury and postponed consumption in terms of the sacrifices that had to be made for, for nation building. But this frozen effect of rights or the frozen effect of the citizenship uh, becomes then the point or the basis for thinking about, again, a renewed relationship between you know, art and the political. Because if Kafka saw art as the, the, the possibilities of unthawing or unfreezing, then the, the question might be, might this be a model for imagining uh, uh, an insurgent imagination of citizenship, which relies not so much on the freeze effect as much as on, on, on the unthawing. Samson and Giorgio, interestingly, point out to the limits and the impossibilities in a way of cultural boundaries uh, and allow us for a much more vitalized language of contamination. Uh, so if, if boundaries are impossible, the example from Tarkovsky, which is really of music being precisely the form, the non-representational form, which at the same time carries the burden of cultural, rep of cultural difference, being that which moves in and out just in the form of you know, the possession that, that, that you spoke of, yeah, uh, <clears throat> reminded me of a lovely statement that Ashish Nandi had once made, where he says that cricket is the quintessentially Indian game, accidentally invented by the British. Uh, in the same way that Mozart is a quintessentially Hong Kong composer, accidentally born in, in, in Europe. So when Samson looks at the entire idea of the amateur orchestra, uh, might it not be then a compelling argument to be made of the misreading that we have of amateurism? Because if it's not so much the amateur as much as its root, which is the amatory, that which comes from the heart, there is a gesture towards how passion and enthusiasm, which is of course an extremely contagious kind of, a, of an affect, uh, 
might be a case where, uh, to be made for how contagion might not only be inevitable, but perhaps our greatest hope. Um, as a critic who has lived in Singapore for many years and has written about the art from that particular region, I'm quite interested in uh, uh, Kinney's proposition uh, of your exhi upcoming exhibition um, because I, was, I could not quite understand what your proposition was and where was the critique in it. Um, if your proposition was to examine the legacy of Lee Kuan Yew through some buns, I mean, I think that's quite inadequate. Or perhaps I have misunderstood you. Um, but also, I would like to, under, uh, I would like to um, understand what works you're presenting, which artists you're presenting, and how you're presenting them. Because I think it's very difficult for us sitting in India to understand uh, the local context of many of these cities and countries that we're talking about. Um, you mentioned the ISA. Do we understand what the ISA is? It, it's a really vile colonial law. It's the Internal Security Act that pretty much, you know... Um, it means that you can be detained without a trial indefinitely, and this is how the opposition was weakened. This is why um, you didn't quite explain why Sunny Liu's um, uh, uh, graphic novel, the funding for it was withdrawn from the National Arts Council. Maybe we could talk about you know, how these artists are struggling to negotiate between state funding and state spaces. Um, you know, and not trying to bite the hand that feeds you. And let's call a spade a spade. Singapore is a dictatorship. The, the, the last video that you showed, I mean, it, it, pre it presents the Media Development Authority um, as these, you know, goofy government guys who mean well. And that's the banality of evil. That, that's, they're the enemy. They're not non-threatening. They're the enemy. They treat the artists. They understand, what art, they understand what art is. They understand the role of artists, which is why they disempower them. I'm surprised that you've not spoken about this. Um, they understand that you know, the role of the artist is to critique, to challenge. And this is why you cannot challenge, you cannot contest uh, Singapore's political history. This is why funding was withdrawn from Sunny Liu's uh, graphic novel. And I'm surprised also that you've not brought up uh, the case of um, Amos Yi, who's going to spend a 16-year-old child who contested the, the death of Lee Kuan Yew and, and is expected to spend a total of 39, 39 days in prison. Maybe we need to talk about the local context of, of the cities that we are talking about. I, I found it very difficult, for example, to follow their presentation on Mexico yesterday. And I knew it was very profound and very pertinent, but I couldn't quite follow Without flying the flag, I had 15 minutes to encapture everything from racial diversity, the failure of multiculturalism, um, the ISA, the 50 years worth of Operation Spectrum, anti-Marxist operation, and the lack of the lack of racial diversity. So, with 15 minutes, I'm not too sure that how I can speak about that without polarizing it, and especially when everything that you laid in front of me is true. And we can all accept that whatever Zizek said about neoliberal capitalist model of Singapore is true. But how do we go around from that? Because it's so easy to polarize, it's so easy to say like Singapore, you censor a 16-year-old for doing an internet comic of Lee Kuan Yew butt-fucking Margaret Thatcher that has nothing to do. I'm happy to talk about that. but. I'm happy to talk about the crassness and the issue that comes with it, but you have to understand um, that he was, it was not about being silly, it was about like the case that he tried to make and the more delicate issues that come behind it. Look at Amos E. Three charges were laid against him, one of them for one of them, um, one of the, most of them, he had the chance to be prosecuted by the prime minister himself, but the charge didn't go through. He had the, he had the, the only charge that stuck on him was sort of offending the religious community. Now, look at that, what does that tell you? It's not about him being persecuted, it's about the charges that have been waived and the charges that he's being pinned to. So how do you talk about that in 15 minutes? So, I'm not, I'm not saying that like, I'm not flag waving, I'm not saying that I am airbrushing all of this. 
And as an exhibition, my question is like, how do I actually make all these underlining issues come out? When I talk about the language, which is why a luxury we cannot afford, the title itself talks about the language as opposed to the singular acts that happen. When you look in terms of art history, when you look in terms of literature, when you look in terms of popular culture and production. I'm not talking about the artists that I have selected, because I have not really thought about. I'm still working through it. It's in September, which is why I talk about it as an exhibition that has not happened. It's quite acclaimed now, so we know about it. A lot of people are writing about Sunny Liu, so we know about it. Invisible censorship, the kind that you just never hear about, that is, for me, more interesting. Everything that was presented to me is new. So may, call me an ignorant, but this was super interesting and opening, and I'm actually curious to discuss more after the 15 minutes. So. Perhaps let's give a chance to a conversation as well. Uh, I, I really, really enjoyed the presentation, and I think I, like the elements. The, there are lots of elements, even though you're talking about uh, like s sort of different things. Uh, but this idea of language um, and this idea of how songs or music uh, become a certain language. So they're either uh, a language that's being dictated and a rhetoric that's being sold, uh, or the the language of communities uh, or groups uh, or the way we read into different times and points in history, etc. Um, and I'm also sort of projecting a lot of the way I think about songs and music. But Yanni, anyway, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I think my question is sort of, Yanni, could apply to Giorgio or Samsung. Um, uh, I, um, I love the way you sort of deconstructed and reconstructed what an orchestra is, what it represents, all its different uh, pieces, and you sort of recon de reconstruct them in different ways. Uh, and I'm curious as to how you're going to, or how, how that could be applied to um, the community orchestra. I mean, what, I mean, Communities have languages, like you say, that, they're, uh, that are made of the sort of social elements of the community, like the crazy cat lady and the way they run their day-to-day -day life, etc. And that could be translated into song and lyrics that make sense or don't make sense to people outside of the community. So if we're thinking about a community orchestra, what, what do you imagine the elements would be? What sort of instruments would they use? Um, do, do people play Chinese instruments in their day-to-day -day life, uh, lives, or do they play other kinds of instruments, or will they be using, for example, materials uh, that they deal with in their everyday day? How do, they, how do they experience music? How do they express it? Um, and what, is it, why are you choosing the orchestra as, as, a, as a framework? Uh, for the community, do, do, do our, I mean, do community orchestras already exist? Is this why there's this format? I'd love to hear how you'd apply this on the community orchestra, even if it's, I mean, I understand it's still a work in progress, but it's, it was very, I mean, it was very exciting to hear, like, the inner workings or the sort of, I mean, the way you're coming to your projects. Um, Okay. Um, uh, hi. Thanks for a thanks for a great session. And I'm going to sort of, uh, but I want to ask a question in two different ways, um, provoked largely by Lawrence at the end, but also trying to sort of figure out how to move from contagion to the orchestra. And I was reminded when you were doing the orchestra of the St. Petersburg lot. I mean, it seemed like an impromptu way of thinking about collectives in some sense, because that's what it's. Uh, uh, I, I was thinking of. But I was. Yeah. Okay. I said when. With Samson's presentation, I was reminded of the presentations on St. Petersburg because it felt like, I mean, what you were presenting would all could be recast as an impromptu collective. I mean, there was an attempt to sort of think about orchestra as a version of the collective. But the question I had for those of you, I, I must say when Lim was presenting, I was so envious of the found objects. I have to, I mean, I was sort of like aghast, like anything to have that level of detritus from which you could actually make a presentation in whatever form it appears. But with with that in mind, which I think com would uh, sort of uh, the question for the, those of you present around music, Giorgio and Samson, I was very curious about white noise and static and music because that's the other stuff that interferes 
in the audio waves, right? And I'm particularly thinking about the kind of new ageiness that you have spreading across because you've got the classical transplant, but you've also got cutting into that an aesthetic of the new age, which you hear everywhere. You hear it on elevators, you hear it in malls, etc. So there's a kind of numbingness that takes place, right? So I was curious how, would, how that would play itself out. And I do think it plays right into the kinds of attempts methodologically on Lim's case, sort of finding found stuff, so it's found noise, found sounds, etc. So anyway, here it is. I'm trying to be crisp so that somebody else can ask a question. Yeah. Uh, you collect questions and then you answer. I would like to ask a question, how, what would be your proposal and what kind of work you'd like to realize for a draft? Are you working together or you're doing separate project? Is it how you build that kind of community? <laughs> and we, <laughs> is it representing Hong Kong or it's related to institution or something like that? Okay, much enjoyed and something which I also found interesting is the notion of translation which I think also runs through all the, the presentations like post-colonial translation of concepts, music and also popular culture and very often this is like uh, caught with the, with the notion of hybridity and I think also Lawrence you refer to that when you said contagions, contagion could be our hope and I would just like to perhaps comment or, or ask for example, in Samsung's, uh, Samsung's uh, presentation, I really like this idea of like uh, using the local vernacular to remember um, the languages of, of the classical music in this last project. In Europe, or probably also in, in the US, there's also like a popular cultural uh, practice which is like misheard lyrics. I don't know whether you know about it. And this is used, I would say you could read misheard lyrics as, a, as, a, as also a racist practice. It is like you listen to like, for example, Hindi Bollywood sound or Turkish sound, and then you start to use uh, the, your own vernacular language to imitate the, the sounds. And what is inside in this reading is like also to say the other language is like uh, gibberish. You know, it's not a rational language which makes sense. So I was wondering like how to think about translation and hybridity in specific power relations. So in your case, it might be something like a subversive action in the context of this misheard lyrics. I would read it also like as a racist uh, um, uh, practice. So I would really like to think about like this question of how is it possible to have look at different hybridities which are Im Im implicated by different power relations. Or also, for example, in, in this, the thing I work on is like how hybridities are commodified in the context of commercial multiculturalism or m multinational companies who use inter intercultural uh, competencies as assets. So I would really like to historicize and, and complicate the question of translation and discuss that somehow you know, on a transnational level. So there, there were a couple of questions. I, I think I'll take the, I'll take the ones that, that are about the work itself, um, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to the others. Um, there, there was a question that, that was, I guess, more generally about how, how do we plan to go about um, accomplishing the project, and then how, like, what form the work is going to take. Um, of course, we, we, we cannot say with any precision what form the work is going to take uh, yet. We, we've had a couple of ideas. We started booking theaters. <laughs> yeah, so we, we started actually looking at a theater that belongs to a Guy Fong Association. Uh, or, uh, so we, we, we started thinking about that. It might be a performance, it might be a show. We, we don't know, it's, it's a little loose right now, uh, which is great. Uh, but I, I am specifically very interested to look at um, 
Uh, I, well, I guess I want to start by looking at why orchestras were set up in certain communities in the first place. Because I, I was having a conversation with somebody here yesterday whose name I cannot remember, I'm very sorry, about where, like how orchestras were set up in this part of the world, for example, and is, uh, sort of uh, the, the history of the, the orchestra as a colonial legacy in India and how it has a relationship with the spread of Christianity specifically, but of course it's a very different context because local musical culture is very strong here, unlike in Hong Kong. Basically, we, um, we, we, the, the, the sort of European musical culture took over. And, and then, of course, if you look at the history of the uh, institutions like the Hong Kong Arts Festival or the, Hong, or the Hong Kong Phil, it was first funded and set up by the Hong Kong government after the riots because the, the, the young people were deemed to be too loose and free and they were bored and so they needed an orchestra and needed an arts festival. So, and, and it, the, the, before it became a professional orchestra, it was actually a community orchestra. It was just like a self-organized effort. And another professional orchestra in Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Sinfonietta, also had a history of self-organization. It, it was started by a bunch of local musicians because local musicians were not being hired by the Hong Kong Phil. And so they thought that they needed to start a second orchestra that would be for a local musician. And then later on, it, it was turned into a professional orchestra. So I'm... I'm even for community orchestra, I wonder if there's a way for me to look into like how and why did they start in the first, first place. And I think that's probably um, where I'm going to start. Yeah. I think for being um, elaborating on Samson's point, the riots were like part of their part in Hong Kong in 60. The riots happened in 67 in Hong Kong itself at a very polemic time itself where there was a fight between the leftists and the rightists and the right-wing government that was leaning more towards the British colonial powers. So just to elaborate on that point. With regards to how we are going to try to work together. Okay, sorry. Okay. So Okay. I'm not very good at karaoke, so, you know, not very used to the mic. So, a bit of context is that the riots that Samson actually referred to is from 1967, where it was, it was one of, it was the biggest riot that ever happened in Hong Kong itself in this, in this area of North Point, where initially we were considering, um, Hosting the hosting the orchestra like these are very loose and tentative ideas right now or the performance The riots itself was sort of the defining moment where Local Hong Kongers found themselves caught between the communist China and the British colonial English system itself and in 67 chose to side with the British British colonial government kind of interesting point So that's a very short way of putting that into context for us, how to work together, this would be interesting because at this point of time, we were, I mean, as you can see, we come from many different fields itself, like in which that we talk about the language and the language of how the artwork will manifest. Actually, for us, this is more like a negotiate, how do you create a mode of negotiation in a different language that's more intrinsic and more sincere to to our audience as opposed to, as opposed to what we're trying to put out since we have mind that this will occur in Hong Kong in 2016. So does that answer the question? Um, to continue again on the question uh, from, from St. Peter's book, I think uh, 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 one key um, aspect of, or, or condition for a, the spark to happen is that we maintain our identities. So I think it's very, and I think today was an example of the kind of collaboration that Parasite is having with, with Samson and I. Uh, um, it's a kind of implied, uh, or if you wish, a, a form of editing. Think about it in terms of editing or montage. So I think this is, and we don't think the, the, the artwork or the presentation or the public event, whatever it would be, is, is, the only, um, is the only thing that matters. I think we're taking drafts on guidelines, I think rather literally, and we're happy to do so. So the process itself and the creation of new terms of collaborations between different fields 
is what we're really interested in pursuing. I also wanted to add something about translation. What we're talking about here is not just um, linguistic translation, but um, um, picking up a practice. So when, when you practice music, when you create a, you know, when you transplant a tradition, um, you're not just translating it, uh, you know, in a, in a it, translation is really a, a, a mere metaphor because your body, you know, a whole social organization configuration um, um, is, is transformed by the fact of music making. So translation is to some extent a, a word that diminishes the scope of what we're addressing here. Um, and um, yeah, uh, the vernacularization of uh, high forms has been going on for a long time. I mean, it's of course uh, so changing words and, and that's, that's a universe, I, I think probably cross-cultural phenomenon. And I think we'll have to take that into account, the fact there are very similar practices uh, uh, across cultures uh, that will enrich the project. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh. Uh, to what? Yes. No, I 